Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our latest seminar in the wrist technical series. And we have a really interesting group assembled today for uh, introducing some use cases that have to do with the wrist advanced profile. Um, if, if you've been following wrist, you'll know that there's been a lot of things uh, being developed. Uh, we're taking a lot of time to build on a very strong foundation, adding some important new features. And what we really wanna focus on in this presentation is to bring everybody up to speed on the advanced profile and also to give people some idea of why all these features are important and how they really impact the usability of wrist in the broader world of professional video transport. So my name is Wes Simpson. I'll be your host and moderator today. Uh, please feel free to use the questions feature of the Zoom webinar platform. We'd love to hear from anybody who has any questions and I'll do my best to answer all the questions that come in. Um, I'm the founder of learnipvideo.com. I've been involved with uh, IP video for 20 some odd years now. And I'm also the co-chair of the wrist activity group within the video services forum. So joining me today, we have Raul Diaz from Intel. Welcome Raul. Uh, thank you, Wes. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm the lead architect uh, for cloud and edge video software at Intel in the network and edge group. Uh, we work on efficient media transport, processing, AI, and compression. And we participate in the video services forum in a number of activity groups, including RIST, which is an important protocol for reliable high throughput media transport. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Raul. Um, uh, we also have Sergio Amarada from SIP Radius. Welcome, Sergio. Thank you. Um, I'm the founder and chief scientist of SIP Radius and Amox. Uh, we do all sorts of uh, broadcasting um, software and hardware, and we also maintain, uh, creating and maintain the open source library Librist uh, that anybody can use to implement the protocol. Thank you. All right, thanks, Sergio. We also have uh, Ciro Noronha from Cobalt Digital. Welcome, Cyril. Thank you, Wes. My name is Cyril Noronha. I'm the Executive Vice President of Engineering for Cobalt Digital. Uh, Cobalt has been involved in RISC since day one. Cobalt makes a lot of um, uh, equipment for broadcasting and RISC is an uh, integral part of uh, a number of our products, our compressed products. Um, I've been a participant in the uh, RIST AG since its foundation. I'm currently the editor of the RIST specifications and also the president of the RIST forum, which is, we'll, we'll learn more about it during the presentation. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ciro. And last but not least, we have Adi Rosenberg with Alvalinx. And, and Adi, I, I'm interested to hear us um, tell you, hear you tell us about uh, your new organization, because I think it's different than what many people remember from the last time you were on one of these webinars. Thank you, Wes, uh, for the introduction. Yes, uh, my name is Adi Rosenberg. I'm the founder of Arvalinx. Arvalinx is a new uh, company working on technology which will be based on RIST and to take the RIST uh, capabilities to the next frontier, cloud delivery, AI-based, and a lot of uh, new uh, applications that uh, will come up from the usage of RIST in our industry and other industries that are seeking to bring live video to the cloud and in the cloud. I have been a member of the RIST uh, activity group since 2018, contributing a lot of technology and starting uh, activities and uh, ideas. Uh, I'm also a veteran of the broadcast <coughs> industry for the last 25 years. And I bring a lot of uh, funny stories and uh, use cases to this activity groups and future uh, ideas. Well, well, RIST wouldn't be what it is without you, Adi. So thank you and, and thanks. Thank you to everybody here on the panel for your contributions and for your participation today. So let, let's get started. Uh, we put together a, a little um, presentation and uh, want to let, again, the audience, at any time, if you have a question, please use uh, the Q&A function 
uh, within your Zoom window. Uh, you have some controls down at the bottom. Uh, put your question in. Uh, we'll try to do our best to get to all of the questions that are being asked today. And uh, we really want to make this a dialogue so that if uh, you hear something you want to comment on or you want to get clarification on, or you'd just like to learn something new, uh, please feel free to fill, fill that in. So um, we're going to go ahead and um, go through, a, a, again, a, a brief presentation. And again, the focus is going to be on what RIST is and what RIST can be used for. So that's really what you should be listening for. So who is behind RIST? A quick review of RIST simple and main profiles, overview of the advanced profile, and then some use cases from each one of our panelists on uh, how you can put um, advanced profile to use. So who is behind RIST? Well, it's really a group that was formed within the Video Services Forum, which is an industry organization that's been around for um, well over 20 years now. And the VSF has really been focused on video services, particularly in the realm of transport, moving video from one place to another. And we've always believed that it's important to have interoperability between many different companies so that we can get the most leverage for our technology. Uh, besides RISC, some of the other technologies that have come out of uh, work that was done at the Video Services Forum include SMPTE 2022, uh, SMPTE 2110, and um, a lot of things that are going on in the world of uh, JPEG 2000 and uh, JPEG XS today. So the group that we're all members of is the RIST Activity Group, which are the technical folks. Uh, we produce the specifications that are published for free on the Video Services Forum website, which anybody can go to and download. Uh, we're also supported by the RIST Forum, who is a marketing group that is uh, made up of many different members. You can see a, a sampling of the logos of all those different people here. And um, all these people have joined the RIST Forum uh, for the goal of learning more about RIST, um, helping to interact with other companies that uh, work with RIST, and to help uh, drive uh, market usability and interoperability of the RIST specifications. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Ciro for a, a quick overview of the RIST simple and main profiles. Thank you, Wes. So we want to give you a, a, a quick tour. This is not going to be a long thing. It's going to be a quick tour of uh, simple main profiles and then advanced profiles. So next slide, please. All right. Um, quick overview of the milestones. Um, Risk Activity Group uh, was formed in 2017. It was really formed in February of 17, but we didn't do anything until April of 17 at NAB when we really decided to start the work. And it took us a year to, to come up with the, the first specification. Um, we demonstrated the full multi-vendor interop in September of 18. In October of 18, we uh, published the risk simple profile. That was followed by risk main profile in March of 2020. And the, then followed by risk advanced profile, which was published in October 2021. So that's the main milestones. Uh, some of these have been reviewed uh, and we'll see next. Next slide, please. So um, as Wes indicated, all risk specifications are available free of charge at the VSF site. That's, that's how I like it. Standard specifications, everything should be free of charge so you can read it and implement. So uh, good thing, you can go get it anytime. Um, we recently uh, published uh, the 2022 version of TR062 main profile, which includes a full documentation for EAP SRP authentication. And we also added uh, VSF ether type, but the EAP SRP authentication is the big thing. Um, allows you to, to have nice things like multicast authentication. Uh, what's in the publication queue? Um, a minor revision of advanced profile, 
that adds the same AAPS RP authentication is in the queue. It's submitted to the VSF board for approval. And um, also TR64 part one source adaptation. Uh, my friend Aji is going to talk about that. The specification is uh, basically ready to be submitted for publication and it will be uh, published shortly. Next slide, please. So this is a little diagram of risk profiles and levels. Um, simple profile gives you reliable transport with ARQ and multi-link support. So simple profile gets it there. Uh, main profile get, gives you tunneling, so simplifies your IT and gives you security, encryption, authentication, and everything. So, uh, and that's layered. So baseline, baseline gives you tunneling, and then the next level, either DTLS or PSK, gives you uh, encryption and authentication. And I'm not going to go into details on that. There are many, many talks about this. So this is just to set up the, the naming. Next slide, please. Now let's talk about advanced profile. So we have the basis of simple and main profile, but now this, this webinar is really about advanced profile use case. So let's, let's give you a quick overview of advanced profile. So what is an advanced profile? Well, simple profile gives you, uh, um, gets the, the content there, and main profile gives you security. Advanced profile provides all of that in the tunnel. So you can deliver any protocol over RIST. If uh, RIST will do the job of, of basically both security and delivery to any protocol. Also, does it does transparent fragmentation and lossless compression. Uh, we enhance the security. Yeah, security was already very, very good, but gives you more options. And we have something called direct payload, which, um, basically reduces the overhead and you can put uh, different types of media directly into the, the uh, into the tunnel and declare what it is. And then uh, flow attributes, which I'm not going to talk very much about, but it's a, a language to describe what's in the flow. Next slide. So the big deal with advanced profile, one of the big deals is advanced bidirectional tunneling. So Advanced Profile gives you an RTP tunnel, tunnel with packet recovery and security. So you can run any legacy protocols over that tunnel and enjoy the benefits of risk, risk with uh, all the packet loss recovery and everything. So that's the main thing we're, we're talking about today, and we'll see that in the use cases. Next slide, please. So what are the benefits? The Advanced Tunnel benefits. Um, we can push any protocol to one or more destinations. So RISC takes care of all the packet recovery. There is no limit on the bitrate support. That's very important. People tend to think uh, uh, about RISC about, yeah, it's something for compressed, uh, a few megabits per second. No, no limit to the bitrate. We can go up from audio all the way to 2110. And in fact, the packet format it was chosen in conjunction with the 2110 over one link. So it was designed from the get-go to, to go to high bit rate. Also, it supports multiple classes of service and expedited support. So you can use it for ground to cloud, cloud to cloud, and cloud to ground as well. So it's a perfect solution for inside and outside the cloud. Next slide. Well, we're all tech heads, so we need to talk about technical details. So this is all based on RTP format aligned with the work uh, being done by the SMP2110 over one. So common format. Um, it, the, the, the sequence number extends to 32 bits, which was a limitation of the original RTP. We have a one megahertz timestamp for precise timing. And we added a whole bunch of optional fields to support this enhanced functionality. If you wanna know what those fields are, the specification is free to download. So the payload of such an RTP packet is an encapsulated tunnel packet or a control packet, and we define the full control language for that. Next slide. Transparent fragmentation. And I, I know I'm talking really fast because I want to get to the meat of that, which is really the use cases, and <laughs> let the other guys talk. So transparent fragmentation is very important today because sometimes you have MTU mismatches, you have big packets. So 
IP solved this problem 30, 40 years ago by fragmenting, but then the fragments go out by themselves, right? It's messy and permanent. It's messy because if you don't receive the fragment, you can't make the packet again. The risk fragmentation is reversible and packets are restored to their original state by the, the tunnel receiver. But the main thing is ARQ operates in fragments. So if a fragment is lost, we can do fragment level ARQ. So that's the big deal with risk fragmentation. That's what's new. And, we do, and because we, we can recover the fragments, the fragmentation scheme is actually much simpler than IP fragmentation. So we put the packet together and then we defragment. It's much, much simpler. So um, I, I can say we did very well there. I mean, I'm, I'm biased, but I think we did very well there. Next slide. Um, we added also lossless compression to wrist. So there's optional LZ4 compression it is based on IP comp. So uh, it can significantly reduce signal bandwidth for uncompressed. Compressed signals, eh, more or less, depends on the null packets. But you can't compress very much a compressed signal. But we can, uh, uh, the specification is, is done in such a way that you can update it in the future. So if some smart people come up with some better ways of compressing, we can add that. And we, we, we basically copy that from IP comp. Next slide. So what's coming in the pipeline. We talked about part one, which is source adaptation. That's actually ready. It's just not published yet. Uh, it, it's in, in the final review process. So after that, you're going to see use of WireGuard, WireGuard VPN in risk systems, because we want to open to other types of uh, VPN. Uh, there's a simple TR. Then, uh, so the work is complete, as you need to write it. It's in the, in the writing queue. Then part three is the risk relay for firewall traversal. It's, uh, it's also work is complete. And if you're coming to IBC, I'm going to be talking about that in the IP showcase. Uh, part four is receiver synchronization. Is, is also complete the technical work and there are demonstrations of that. And now we're taking the big one, which is control and management for risk. And that's going to take a while. And then we're going to think about congestion control, hy hybrid SAT, and uh, risk IGMP listener. And uh, you will find out about that when we finish that, probably next year. All right. Now we get to the meat of this webinar. Uh, this is why I talked very fast, advanced profile use cases. So uh, let me jump in here for a second, Cyril. I, we had a couple of questions come in. I just wanted to throw them out there. Um, the first one is um, any interest in adding FEC so I can lower latency by removing the ARQ buffer? And I just want to say, you know, straight up, you know, RIST was designed specifically with uh, forward error correction in mind. In fact, um, if you are sending a SMPTE ST 2022 2 stream over RIST simple profile, the first thing that we came out, that RIST would support um, both sending the uh, payload packets as well as the FEC packets. So um, that was in there from the get go. And, um, you know, Adi, did you, would you want to add anything to that? Yeah, RIST gives you the choice to select whether you want to use FEC. If your line doesn't have that high packet loss, and you are, uh, you've, you are okay with the FEC. Really simple profile will support that. You can, of, of course, do that with the main profile, send that through. If you want to lower your uh, time, your latency time, you might use 70-20-22-7 seamless switching, send two uh, simple profiles, so that, and then you can reduce the buffer even uh, further, it depends on the bit rate. So uh, you will then compensate, you basically compromise higher bit rate versus lower latency. ARQ is there only if you have higher packet loss, 5% and higher, then the ARQ will shine over the FEC. All right, and uh, what I wanted to throw um, Sergio's way, um, does RIST support a source specific multicast uh, input and output? Well, it, it, the the RISC protocol will support anything, uh, you know, at the binary level. So it w it's up to the implementer to grab and send the multicast any way, any the way they want. We do plan to have additional uh, support on the open source version to 
for the protocol and the AMT as well to do automatic multicast transmission from sender to receiver. But the protocol itself is agnost agnostic. You can you can send anything you want. The, impl the implementation takes care of uh, adding the the glue to do the multicast bridge between two endpoints. So so following on with that, um, the, the um, question came in, any interest in adding AMT? Well, a a the adding AMT to the protocol itself is, is you know, it's already implied. You know, a any protocol like this one can be used uh, over a, a risk tunnel. The, the specific implementation can be made generic enough maybe at, the, at some point to write a... Uh, a recommendation or maybe uh, just an addendum. Uh, definitely, when we get to that point, we're going to implement it in the in the open source library, and uh, then we'll see if it's worth adding as a an ad, you know addendum to one of the documents. That's great. And one more question, real quick. Um, maybe Sarah, you you would want to take this. You know, what about um, PTP transport? And do you have you had any experience with that? No, not specifically. I mean, Cobalt, Cobalt does play in the SMT2110 arena, so we have a lot of experience with uh, PTP. Uh, PTP and RISTA play in different play in different fields, right? If you uh, RISTA itself doesn't require PTP and it's independent of PTP, nothing prevents you from running PTP in the same network. But they they do different things, so. Um, it's not part of the specification, but it's not in conflict either. It's the same as SSM and a AMT. Uh, those are things that RISC can work with, but uh, there's no need to change RISC or, or interface it. Or they, they just are companions. Yeah, and just building on this, I mean, there, there would be no reason why you couldn't send uh, PTP packets through a, a RISC advanced profile tunnel, but you'd have to think about your use case real carefully to figure out if that made sense or not. Would that be a good way of saying it, Cyril? Yes. Okay. All right, well, let's dive into the use cases since that's what we um, we came here for. And the first one goes to you, Ciro. Um, legacy multi-stream transport. Okay, thank you, Wes. So as I pointed out in the introduction, the risk of advanced profile provides a tunnel that can provide risk services to anything, to any legacy protocol. So this is what I'm showing here. Um, legacy multi-stream transport. And multi-stream is multi-protocol multi transport. So I, I came up with three, three different sources. The first one on the legacy encoder, uh, pretty much any, any broadcast encoder out there does transport stream over UDP. That's kind of the baseline. Everybody does that. That has no no packet loss recovery, no resequencing, no nothing. You just take the transport stream and, and stick stick that into UDP, um, and th that in fact was good enough for, for some of the first uh, uh, IP distribution um, to homes if you had a, a good enough network. Now I give you a good enough network, and it's the internet. You can just take that legacy encoder that just does TS over UDP and flow of an advanced profile tunnel. And the same TS over UDP, exact same packets come out on the other side, but with the packet loss and low latency transport. And if you want, if you need encryption, the, the, the tunnel will do that for you. So all we need is an advanced profile gateway. The second legacy uh, multi-stream transport, the le second legacy example is RTMP. Uh, I know when you say RTMP, people people tremble, right? Because oh yeah, it's old and <laughs> that doesn't work. It's a protocol that runs over TCP and it has all the the basic limitations of TCP. You hit it with packet loss, it just shuts down. And it's not just RTMP; it's any TCP. So you want to send that over the internet over a more uh, challenging link, but you have some legacy application that got to use RTMP, just throw an advanced profile gateway in the middle. It'll, it'll give that TCP a very clean, clean uh, channel. TCP will be really happy. it will deliver it just fine. And finally, it's an application that uh, we at Cobalt actually sell our equipment for, which is receiving RTSP traffic cameras. So a lot of those uh, uh, surveillance cameras out there, you speak RTSP. And RTSP is basically 
a TCP control panel, a control channel plus a UDP flow, which can also be tunneled, tunneled over TCP, which is what most people do in the internet anyway. So you throw it in a TCP tunnel. Um, and then you have this kind of the same problem as RTMP. You could throw it in an advanced profile gateway. You can get rid of the TCP. You can put the camera in UDP mode only. And that will work just fine. Um, and the, all the packet loss and the, uh, the low latency is, is taken care of, especially for broadcasters where you want to put that camera on there. That's, that's the typical use case. They have the camera looking at the freeway, the bridge, or whatever, and they will put it in the news. So that's the normal use case. With, uh, with an advanced profile gateway, you can reliably use the internet for that, and you don't need to make any changes to the camera, and you know it's going to work because you're not depending on, on either uh, unprotected RTP or uh, TCP tunneling of the, the RTSP. So you can combine all of that in an advanced profile gateway with low latency transport for the camera, that's important, packet loss recovery, which is gonna fix your TCP, encryption authentication if you need, if you need that. And finally, if you, you don't have to fight too much with your IT people because one, only one UDP port is required. You, you, you run all of that. So that's kind of the typical classical application of, of the uh, advanced profile. Okay, we do have a question here. Um, it says, we do RTP with RTCP. I wonder if I should have different risk settings for my RTP versus RTCP data. Anybody want to well, take that toss up question? Looks like a D. I'm I could, I could uh, make a Go ahead, Raul. Yeah. Yeah, on that. So um, it's quite common to have uh, very different networks for uh, R RTP and RTCP traffic. Um, uh, RTP is is generally going to be your your payload, right? You're you're delivering your media, so it'll be very high bandwidth. You, you probably want low latency. Um, and so you have some other uh, control that could be SD2110 on top of that, could be other, other protocols. And uh, your RTCP, uh, you're controlling uh, your, your endpoints. And with RTCP, you can send that through uh, a completely different uh, NIC that could be uh, lower bandwidth. It could be, you can just go through the kernel stack. You may not need a high efficiency uh, user plane stack like you might use for RTP like uh, DPDK or something or VPP or something like that. So it would be, you can send them completely differently and configure them completely differently. Great, thanks for that. Okay, so um, let's move on. And again, you know, please uh, feel free if you're in the audience, uh, put those uh, questions in the uh, question bar and we'll try to get to them as soon as we can. Uh, next up, we have Sergio, and he's got a, a similar looking diagram, but I think it's pretty different, right, Sergio? Yeah, correct. The colors are similar, but the, this is a quite different application. And uh, let me put it into context. We call it on demand risk workflows. And this is a scenario where you have geographically distributed sources, whether they're uh, you know, 2110 sources, SDI, IP multicast, unicast. And that's what we call here on the, le on the left, uh, you know, this list of encoders. It could be hundreds of encoders spread out of many different locations. And we call those remote office video sources. In this application, what we do is we uh, expose those sources as risk endpoints in what we call listening mode. And uh, with the the ability for us to pull any stream within that particular location, and we do that on demand. And we do that on demand so that any other location involving that infrastructure, could be a multi-location uh, company, it could be any, anything that uh, you know, is distributed geographically, uh, can access those sources and distribute them on the right-hand side you see to the final playback devices. The final playback devices, we want, the, we want to be able to play it on the web browser, uh, maybe a risk decoder connected to an SDI monitor or a legacy player, VLC running RTSP or whatever it is, somebody wants access to hundreds of sources that are across the US, across the world. So uh, with the risk advantage profile, we can do that in a very effective way. We don't have to create a single tunnel for every source to every location. Uh, with the use of an advanced profile, smart relay, 
uh, which besides having the features of our normal uh, wrist, has also the ability to do encapsulation into other uh, protocols or re-encapsulation like WebRTC or RTSP, uh, we can do on-demand risk calls. Uh, a player, whichever happens to be, hits our, our smart relay. The smart relay determines if the source is already there or not. If it's not there, it goes ahead and opens a risk connection to the endpoint and pulls that data stream into the relay. And then from there, it's dispatched to any uh, player waiting for that signal. And uh, the smart relay in this case uh, will keep that connection open to the encoder or to the remote source uh, while there's somebody listening on the playback devices. Uh, you know, after a timeout period where nobody's listening, it shuts down the source. So using this method, you can have uh, a very small advanced profile relay farm serving thousands of sources to thousands of users, uh, which saves you quite a bit of money in infrastructure. And this, so this is something that we have implemented actually already. Yeah, so, so Sergio, um, you, you're talking about something that, that has pretty significant scale. I mean, how, you know, you're, you're talking about hundreds of streams. So is that up and running today? It is up and running today. We have uh, about 500 streams up and running, and it's going to grow about six times that size. And we have 5,000 viewers right now on the right-hand side. Wow. So it sounds like we uh, almost don't need um, television stations anymore, huh? <laughs> well, maybe this will be the future. It, <laughs> yeah. it also gives you, which I didn't mention, end-to-end -end authentication and encryption. With this okay. method, you have a DRM-compliant end-to-end solution from the player all the way to the encoder. So the signal is protected with the, uh, the wrist authentication and encryption all the way through. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Um, uh, next up, we have um, Adi Rosenberg, who's going to talk about link adaptation and a couple other interesting things that you can do with Wrist Advanced Profile. Thank you, Wes. So let's talk about link, link adaptation. Why do we need that? So before, before we started, when we had uh, standard streaming or simple profile, main profile, it was one, one uh, source sending that over one link, multiple links to a destination. And there was no information about the link capacity or what can I do with that? We had a, but the network can change. The link behavior can change. The network is a living thing and that changes over time. It can change on a day, on an hourly basis, on a daily basis and over and uh, even in, at seasons. Just think about how many people go to a vacation and stop streaming or stop listening. Standard error recovery was not designed to overcome link capacity issues. So we had to find a solution. Some links may have limited error recovery capacity and respreading of the stream between multiple links is much more desirable so that we can overcome a problem on one link by using a, an abundance of other links that are available to us, just like the bonded, the cellular bonded solu solutions do today. Sometimes all we are left is, is that we need to change the source. We need to command the source. We don't have enough capacity. We need to command the source to change its behavior, to reduce its bit rate, because we don't have favorable conditions and we cannot guarantee the successful delivery of the feed. So we strive to the highest quality and not to drop to the lowest possible, but if something is not there, then that is the only solution that we can do. So let's go to the next slide and see the past and how do we change that. So beforehand, we had the wrist sender in this example. We had one stream and we had three ISPs. So let's see the automation, uh, the animation. Can you go down? So basically the sender would just see the basic statistics about what is going on. Hear it? We had no statistic statistic on the bandwidth of ISP A, then on ISP B, and of course on ISP C. And that has changed with the introduction of the wrist uh, statistics or link adaptation. We added statistics. That is the main story. Now we have statistics that this, the receiver can share with the sender. Those who are, remember the past, we had RTCP. RTCP had some jitter information, but not full blown information. And we supplemented that with the wrist. 
So now the receiver can send to the sender information about every link, the statistics on the behavior, and to allow the sender to change its behavior or to adapt to those statistics. So if the bandwidth is not there or the excessive packet was on one link, it can direct traffic to other links. And that's what RIST, simple profile, main profile, and advanced profile will give us. Let's jump forward. So let's see an example of a multi-link. In this example, from the get-go, we decided to do a spread of 30, 30, and 40 ratio between ISP A, B, and C. So we start streaming. So let's see the animation. And we see the statistics, and suddenly the statistics the statistics uh, shows that uh, link number C shows unrecovered packets increase and the measured bandwidth has dropped. What is a resender will do? It will recalculate the load between the other links. And then from 40%, let's switch to 20% and see how does that go. So let's see, let's hit the animation. So now we will, rec we will send 20% over Element C, B and A will uh, jump to 40. And let's see how does that behave. And now statistics from C comes back and they will show, hey, everything is fine. We achieved a zero unrecovered packets. We measured the bandwidth. It is well okay. And we can continue to work like that. So in fact, what we gain is an adaptivity that we can change and adapt to the network behavior or changes. ISPA can be a 5G link, ISPB can be a Starlink link or a satellite data link, and ISP can be your internet or fiber. You can now mix and match and adapt between them, something that we couldn't do before. We could do a, a static loacher. We didn't have the dynamic capability of that, and this is what we brought in the advanced profile in the uh, soon-to-be-published uh, TR. So let's, let's go to the source adaptation where we can control the encoder. So we have an encoder that has a 10 megabit uh, source. It's a very good uh, quality. It's H.265, 10 megabits, a very good quality. And we start to stream that to the sender. We have statistics coming back. And everything looks to be okay. We start our NFL game. And once again, we continue that 10 megabit stream, but suddenly the network has, ch has changed and we can only see four megabits. A rate dropped and there's excessive packet loss. What can we do there here? We only have one link. So hit the animation. We calculate what rate can be used based on the statistics. So now we will command we saw that it was achieved only four megabits. We will command the encoder to change its rate to a four megabits. And that is in live, of course, this is the animation is running slowly. And now four megabits are streamed and the receiver is happy. The statistics that we will see will show that four megabits reach its destination, service continues, maybe uh, lower quality, but it is continued. But now, we don't want to waste our time on four megabits. The resender will try to, to, to increase the bit rate. So we'll try to test the five megabits. And we will say that the encoder to send that five megabits and see what is the statistics after that. And rate the statistics says to us rate is okay. There's no packet loss and we are happy. So that is the link adaptation. But what else can I do with that information? So we will start with selecting the best available resources. Before you start or while you are streaming, we can use those statistics to decide what is the best available link for us. We can spread the stream, we can duplicate the stream, but we have more information at our hand, our fingertips to understand what link is better and prefer that. We can then change stream partition between those different paths. Some ideas for you guys. We can do stream partition. Say high, we can send high priority services over the most reliable link and send the other services on the less reliable stream path and re-aggregate them at the receiver. We can send video data over the reliable 
and send audio and, aux and auxiliary data on the non-reliable that because audio can uh, have uh, more ARQ, it's low bitrate. We will then use that and send that over the internet, 4G or 5G. So we partition the stream, but the receiver re will re-aggregate that back and give you that full, uh, uh, full services and components back. And of course, that is not all. As we have more information, we can couple that with RTT and JITRA information to give you a broader view and give you IT people more information about the service and the path behavior so they can work with the service provider to either improve the SLA, reduce the SLA, or change the quality of service parameters. We can have more visibility on how data is traveling and received at the destination. For instance, when you're sending to the cloud and you have no feedback, now you can use the statistics back from the cloud and have more information about how the data was received in the cloud and how uh, you are as the streamer, you have more information. A smart implementation will take the handle and do an autopilot, meaning allow algorithms to run and do the work for you so that you don't have to change that all the time like you did before. So it gives you more freedom to focus on the creation of content and the delivery, and we will take care of the delivery of the content to the to your destination. I think this is the last slide. Okay, great, Adi. Um, and you're right. This is the last slide. Let me um, get it to advance here. And um, let let's go through and and um, have Raul talk about his use cases, and then we have a couple questions in the window. And again, to our audience, if you have questions, uh, feel free to uh, pop them in. If we can't answer them online, we'll try to um, uh, type in an answer, but uh, looking forward to uh, uh, talking to you about these. But first, we'd like to uh, go ahead with Raul. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm a senior principal engineer uh, at Intel uh, working on uh, media transport and media processing. And uh, we have a number of uh, uh, in addition to, to our, our silicon, we also have a number of libraries that we uh, we have available. We have uh, one example is our open source WebRTC toolkit, which uh, is available. Another example is our new Intel Media Transport Library. Uh, this library is uh, currently available uh, under NDA, but will uh, be available more broadly in the very near future. Um, <clears throat> And uh, we support uh, full support for SD2110 on Intel NICs. Uh, and SD2110 is great for local area networks, but we also want transparent uh, connectivity uh, over internet gateways. And, um, you know, I picked a couple of examples of where RIST is really important, but actually everything that that uh, all of the other panelists have, have referred to are, are elements of the uh, presentation that we need. So we have, for example, uh, secure and efficient, uh, you know, reliable transport. Uh, we want it to be as universal as possible. Uh, we want to be able to efficiently transport uh, any type of protocol. Um, we really, uh, you know, because our customers have many different kinds of uh, applications, uh, you know, security is always paramount. So the authentication, authorization, data integrity that RISC provides is uh, is really compelling as as a uh, uh, as a protocol. Uh, one of the um, elements that I find particularly important, uh, particularly for something like SC2110, which can use jumbo packets and tends to use very large uh, packet sizes, even if it's not using jumbo packets, is transparent reversible fragmentation. Um, in in many different uh, uh, networks, the uh, the switches and the routers are, are going to uh, just automatically fragment uh, to some uh, specification that they've set for their ISP delivery. And in those cases, uh, we, we wanna be able to recover our original packet and packet sizes. And so we, we don't wanna make any assumptions about what the uh, intermediate packet transports are going to uh, pa uh, packet uh, transport sizes are going to be. So then we can use the transparent reversible fragmentation to recover our desired uh, packet sizes. Um, which, for example, we might design a packet size to be uh, to cover uh, to carry exactly the number of uh, pixels in a video line 
or something like that. Uh, that's just one example. Um, so th those are areas, but a link adaptation that, that Addy uh, covered is another very important area. And we have a number of products where we can uh, uh, provide telemetry uh, for directly from our Xeons and from our NICs that can be used as uh, data into uh, the statistics uh, flows that Addy was uh, was talking about, and we have uh, the ability to full to provide full network uh, uh, network um, uh, statistics. Um, we have a, a related project uh, in my team, uh, which is uh, called the Network AI Toolkit, which provides the ability uh, to build uh, AI models for these network statistics, supporting all of, all, you know, creating a full system implementation. So uh, at Intel, we offer a range of different uh, capabilities from silicon to uh, telemetry tools to full libraries and, and even uh, example solutions that we can provide. Uh, and RIST is a really important uh, protocol in, in that uh, uh, the, the, the features that RIST offers are really important uh, to the types of solutions that our customers are trying to, uh, to solve. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raul. Um, uh, what I wanna do right now, we have a few questions in the uh, Q&A panel. So, um, I'm going to deal them out. First one, um, the question is, and this one's going to Sergio, uh, when will on-demand RIST be available in LibRIST? All right, on-demand really has two components, uh, you know, if you look at the diagram. The first part is already there, which is the ability to configure a sender in what we call listening mode with authentication and everything else and encryption, it's already there. Uh, you can set up any sender to listen to a port and you can set up security uh, based on uh, our, our new SRP protocol. The second component of the on-demand RIST is the smart gateway. The smart gateway is not part of the LibRIST library. We do plan to release uh, another binary, just, just like the resender and RIST receiver that will, be, will have this capability. I think we're gonna enhance the ones that we call RIST to RIST. Uh, it's gonna be based on that one. Uh, for now, on our implementation, we're using a, a, a different open source project that we've uh, added RISC to, uh, to accomplish this. It's a multimedia uh, server that can convert between different uh, formats. It's, it's another open source project, and I, I can talk about it offline. All right. Thank you, Sergio. Um, next, uh, the question is, and we'll toss this one to Ciro, how does the communication happen with, with the encoder? Uh, which, what spec is there? And, and again, we're talking about the uh, adaptive uh, yes. feedback. Go Thank ahead. You. Thank you. So when we started doing this this work in, in RIST, we identified really two protocols. A protocol from the receiver to provide statistics to the sender of the statistics, statistics that IG has, uh, has uh, talked about. And then a second protocol, technically independent of that, which will be uh, in case of the gateway and the encoder are different devices, the gateway to command the encoder. So uh, this first protocol between the uh, receiver and the sender to send statistics back is TR064 part one, which is about to be uh, published. And uh, it's got two components uh, for simple profile. We extended the RTCP message and for, for its advanced profile, we created new control messages. Now for the protocol, in case you have a legacy encoder and the risk gateway and the risk gateway has to tell the encoder what to change. Um, after some discussion in the risk AG, we decided not to specify that protocol because uh, if it's a legacy encoder, it's probably not gonna put a new protocol. So um, we decided it wasn't worth our time to define a protocol. Uh, encoder vendors or, or encoders that don't have risk, because if the encoder has, has risk, all the, the receiver statistics are sufficient. It's implemented in the encoder. The encoder doesn't have risk. It, it normally has another protocol already. It's typically SNMP, but can be other things. And uh, it's unlikely that we'll adopt anything else. So uh, the risk AG decided that they would not uh, specify that protocol, we'll leave it open. You're gonna integrate, if you're doing a gateway, you're gonna integrate with the encoder, uh, whatever the encoder does. Can I supplement on that? Please. 
usually if you have a gateway and you have a third party encoder, you will have to uh, communicate with your encoder vendor and to check whether they can change the bitrate on the fly and what is the communication protocol. Most likely most legacy encoders and vendors will have SNMP and there is like basic SNMP commands to set video bitrate that uh, you can basically execute with a simple net SNMP command. Uh, to the most advanced, they have REST API and there will be a REST API command to change that. And the only thing that you need to uh, be wary of is that uh, whether the encoder can change its bit, what is the time frame that it takes the encoder to change its bit rate? Is it that on the next frame, the next GOP, the next iframe, P frame, and so on? If you don't have that and you have uh, like an implementation like an FFmpeg, what you can do is to create a multitude of profiles just like you will do with uh, HTTP adaptive streaming and then just by yourself select the output, whether it's a unicast, multicast of that FFmpeg. And if they are frame aligned, then it will uh, satisfy the requirement to do the bitrate change. So basically jump between profiles and uh, execute the bitrate change. Yeah. Um, could, could I add a, uh, another comment to Please. this question? Um, th this is a very important question. Uh, one of the things that's, uh, the, that makes RIST uh, so compelling uh, to Intel is that it's universal. It carries any type of message. It, it's, it's a packaging format. It could carry any other protocol. Uh, uh, besides any native protocol that you want, that you're working on. Um, the structure of the messages is system and application dependent. So when you ask questions such as how do I have uh, two endpoints, uh, an encoder and de decoder um, uh, communicate, you need a system definition, you need an application definition. So great examples are, for example, in, in mobile telephony, you, you can go to 3GPP three, three and there are a number of technical specifications there that you can review for different types of of uh, system communication, including full telemetry and full uh, configuration specifications uh, uh, between the uh, the encoder and decoder. Um, another, um, uh, uh, you know, closer to video production side, uh, you have uh, NMOS. You know, and NMOS is actively working on uh, publicly on IS uh, um, on their uh, NMOS IS eleven. Uh, sorry, M MWA is working on uh, IS and MOS, uh, uh, IS 11 and IS 12, which specifically address these types of issues. And again, it's important in any definition of a, of a codec to define the system and the application that you're operating in. And once you do, then you can uh, uh, refer to a standard or develop a standard for that particular use case. Thank you. Well, thanks, Raul. Um, we have a, another question here for Ciro. I mean, again, this is, I think this is a follow-up. It says, so in other words, the encoder will need to have wrist embedded and the encoder will need to check the statistics and decide on the new bit rate to use, correct? Yes, uh, if, if it's an encoder that implements wrist, yes. You can build that functionality directly in, into the encoder. Or as I said, if you, if you have a legacy encoder that only can, has bit rate control, you, you, you create a, a gateway then commands the encoder, but uh, yes, that's how you need to do it. Okay, um, question for Sergio. In the SIP radius example, how does the advanced profile smart relay convert the risk stream to WebRTC or RTSP? Well, it's in this case, it's our own proprietary media server that grabs the input in MPEG TS4 format, demoxes, puts it into the media server, and then re it can re-encapsulate into any uh, format we want, WebRTC, RTSP, another race tunnel, et cetera. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the open source solutions are not there yet. Uh, you know, we're working in conjunction with them to enhance them to be able to do a similar thing. Very good. Um, and then uh, this one I think is for Adi. So what is expected um, risk added latency overhead? Um, and I, the question goes on to say, in the test lab one year ago, it was recommended to add a buffer size on the receiver of three times the round trip time, but not less than 50 milliseconds. But in a local area network of a one millisecond round trip time, RIST would add 49 milliseconds latency overhead. Are there any changes here in the advanced profile? Okay, so I think that uh, the RTT, 
the 50 millisecond is a sound advice, but it, it is implementation specific. I can tell you that I had implementation that my minimal uh, uh, latency could be uh, 10 milliseconds, so we can do at least multiple uh, RTTs uh, if they fit in the 10 millisecond, and I did even a 20 millisecond delivery over 80 megabits from a stadium. So it is supposed to be, I don't know what is the librest minimal uh, uh, RTT, but I know that implementations can uh, be faster. And of course, the advanced profile, because uh, it's uh, dealing with higher de higher bit rates, will probably have the same characteristics of about 10 milliseconds, even less for local uh, delivery. But once again, this is implementation specific and not uh, protocol specific. The, the advice of three times RTT still value, still valid, but if your network is okay, like very low packet loss, you can go with one RTT and you can supplement it with uh, FEC if that uh, fits your bitrate requirements. Or, or so even 2022-7, yeah, okay. That's, that's better, yeah. Okay. Well, we're just about out of time here. Um, if anybody had any uh, closing remarks, um, otherwise I will um, uh, just go ahead and um, take us out. Go ahead, Adi. Yeah, I just want to tell everybody, look, the risk advanced profile is like a library of opportunities for you. We just mentioned a few of them. We did not touch base on the flow ID, the ability to characterize specific flows and gives you hit hints about what is what is traversed, what is sent to you. We show that we can send multiple streams and we then can put priority on that, set them in flows so you can now prioritize the data. There's ample of applications that will come out out of the risk advanced profile and the, and the next protocols that we are going to talk about. Stay tuned for the risk relay that we mentioned. It's a very nice piece of uh, protocol specification that give, will give new applications rise and new capabilities. All right, thanks Adi. Um, anybody else? Okay, um, so again, just to um, let you know, uh, this is uh, Wes Simpson. I'm uh, founder of learnipvideo.com and an active member of the uh, Video Services Forum and the RIST Activity Group. Uh, with us today, we had uh, Raul Diaz from Intel. We had uh, Sergio Amarada from SIP Radius. We had Ciro Noronha from Cobalt Digital and Adi Rosenberg from Ava Links Networks. Um, please uh, feel free to take a look at the uh, RIST uh, forum website. It's at www.ristrist.tv. And uh, we welcome uh, new members. We welcome uh, people that have anything that they want to contribute to uh, the growth and enhancement of RIST protocol. And uh, feel free, if you'd like to participate in developing new capabilities for RIST, uh, join the Video Services Forum and, and get on our activity group. We'd love to have you. So again, thanks to all of our panelists and thank you to our audience with a great bunch of questions. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.